uh, is to get that thing to hold up my. Uh, would you mind grabbing that uh, Gabai's? Um, you know the no, it's next to where I sit. There's a, a black box that the Gabai uses. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Okay. Today we're going to be discussing more in the No, 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 no. Just a black box, a black gabai box. The uh, today we're going to. It's actually useful if you have a chumash, just a regular chumash. If you want to bring a few chumashim from that uh, bookcase over there, thank you, Derek. Um, yeah, right, 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 yeah, right near where I sit. Thank you. No, I don't want to. I don't want to leave it against the chumash. Thank you. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Okay, <laughs> there we go. Okay, today we're discussing the chapter two in Mor Nevuchim, part one. And let's just get our continuity. Nevuchim discussed the nature of being created in God's image, which is that man has intellect. That is what it means to be in God's image. Now, this immediately gives rise to the next discussion in chapter two, which is at what point in the stage of man's development in the Garden of Eden, did he develop intellect? Did he acquire intellect? One reading of the story, which is a superficial reading of the story of the chait of Adam and Chava, implies that man did not fully gain intellect until he sinned of good and evil. And if that's the case, how can you tell me that Hashem created man in his image if he only acquired that image as a result of a degrading act. That's, that's, the, that's the difficulty in the story. And that's what the Rambam's going to go through now. Um, once again, just as a reminder of uh, Shlomo Pine's edition of the Mora Nevuchim in your library, if you're continuing along with the Shir, it's easily uh, gettable at uh, Amazon, so I encourage you to, to get yourselves a copy. But we still have a few copies left. Um, uh, I just made a few photocopies of chapter two. Now, my, my goal today is to go through quickly the text of chapter two and then to really fully unpack it in our next <coughs> se session. I want us to be able to get the tamtzit of what he says, and then there's a tremendous amount of material that's discussed by Reb Chaim Velazhen or Nenefesh HaChaim, and Rev Dessler has a very important essay about this in Mechtav Me'eliyahu. But let's first get our bearings. He says, years ago, a learned man propounded as a challenge to me a curious objection. It behooves us now to consider this obje objection and our reply that invalidated his objection. However, before mentioning this objection and its invalidation, I want to make the following statement. And here's the statement, and we'll have to understand why the Rambam feels he needs to make this disclaimer before going into this discussion. Every Hebrew, or every Jew, knew that the term Elohim or Elohim is equivocal, which means it has ambiguous meaning. The word Elohim sometimes refers to Hashem, and sometimes it refers to what uh, refers to angels and rulers governing cities. It doesn't necessarily have to refer to God. There's like Elohim with an uppercase Aleph, and Elohim, Elohim with a lowercase Aleph, as it were, right? There's no uppercase and lowercase in Hebrew. So Uncle Hager, peace be upon him, has made it clear, and his clarification is correct, that in the dictum of scripture, and this is where having a chumash would be helpful for you, in Perik Gimel, Pasuk He, of the story of Bereshis, what does the Nachash, what does the serpent say to Chava? Ki yodeya Elohim, ki biyom achalchem imenu, that on the day, I, I probably left out a word or two, but on the day that you eat from the tree, you will be like Elohim, knowing good and evil. 
Now, what does the word Elohim mean in that sentence? Does it mean that you will be like God? No, says Onkelis. If you take a look at Onkelis in the Chumash, what does Onkelis say? He says, Usahon kerav revin chakimin bein tav levish. In Aramaic, that means you will be like great ones who are wise to know and to be able to discern the difference between good and evil. So the serpent was not suggesting that by eating of the tree you become like God, but rather through eating of the tree you become like great people. And what we'll see in a moment, it means like great judges. Now, what was the snake actually implying in that statement? We're going to see now, and we'll see why this statement is relevant. This disclaimer is relevant to the rest of the essay. After thus having set forth the equivocality or the ambiguity of this term, we shall begin to expound our objection. This is what the objector said. It is manifest from the clear sense of the biblical text that the primary purpose with regard to man was that he should be, as the other animals are, devoid of intellect of thought and of the capacity to distinguish between good and evil. However, when he disobeyed, his disobedience procured him as its necessary consequence the great perfection peculiar to man, namely his being endowed with the capacity that exists in us to make this distinction. That is, before the sin, man was as dumb as an animal, and it was only after he sinned to discern between good and evil. Now, this capacity is the noblest of the characteristics existing in us. It is in virtue of it that we are constituted as substances, meaning that it is our crowning characteristic. It is what defines us as human beings, right? Now, it is a thing to be wondered at that man's punishment for his disobedience should consist in his being granted a perfection that he did not possess before, namely the intellect. This is like the story told by somebody that a certain man from among the people disobeyed and committed great crimes and in consequence was made to undergo a metamorphosis, becoming a star in heaven. Now, what is he referring to? There are a number of stories in ancient Greek and Roman mythology of people who, become, who do evil and or gods who do evil and then are consigned to become, to metamorphose into something else. Um, he may be even referring to the story of Lucifer, which in ancient Greek means the morning star. In other words, the story of, the, of Satan is that he was originally an angel, and because he sinned, he was made into the, the morning star of Venus. And, uh, but there are other legends of mortals who, because of their sin, become consigned to be placed as a star in the sky. Now, that doesn't make any sense. That's counterintuitive. If you corrupt yourself, why should you be rewarded by evolving into something greater. If anything, you should degenerate. So why is it that man acquires wisdom or intellect as a result of eating, doing a sin of eating from the tree of good and evil? Okay, this was the intent and meaning of the objection, though it was not textually as we have put it. I'm just, he says, I'm basically paraphrasing, says the Rambam. Now hear now the intent of our reply. We said, O oh, you who engage in theoretical speculation, Oh, uh, using the first notions that may occur to you and come to your mind, and who consider with all that you understood a book that is the guide of the first and the last men, while glancing through it as you would glance through a historical work or a piece of poetry. In other words, the, my, first, my first criticism of you is that you're reading the Bible as a piece of literature. And when you look at it, instead of treating it as something which is a guide for the very first man and the very last man, meaning that it has it is infinite in its scope, and it speaks to every single generation, and therefore, perforce, its language is sometimes cryptic. If you're going to read it as a piece of, uh, of contemporary literature, of course you're going to end up confused. When in some of your hours of leisure, you leave off of drinking and copulating, <laughs> collect yourself and reflect for things are not as you thought following the first notion that occurred to you, but rather as is made clear through reflection upon the following speech. In other words, of course you're not going to get it because you're so, you casually pick up this book as, you know, in between your leisurely life. What do you expect? Of course it's going to be given to misinterpretation. For the intellect that God made overflow unto man, and that is the latter's ultimate perfection, was that which Adam had been provided with before he disobeyed. You're making a mistake. 
Of course, when it says that God created man in his image, it means he was granted divine intellect at that moment before the sin. It was because of this that it was said of him that he was created in the image of God and in his likeness, like we said in the last chapter. It was likewise on account of it that he was addressed by God and given commandments. As it says, Vayitzav Hashem Elohim es Adam Lemor, that God commanded man before the sin. You may eat from each of the, the fruit of the, of the garden, the trees of the garden, but do not eat of the tree of good and evil. Right? Because if man was a, was a dumb beast, how could he be subject to commandments? Okay? For commandments are not given to beasts and beings devoid of intellect. Through the <laughs> intellect, one distinguishes between truth and falsehood, and that was found in Adam in its perfection and integrity. And now we get to the crux. So I'm going to read this sentence one more time. Through the intellect, one distinguishes between truth and falsehood, between emes and sheker. And that was found in Adam in his perfection and integrity before the sin. Fine and bad, which are terms in Arabic, which means nice and not nice, on the other hand, belong to the things generally accepted as known, not to those cognized by the intellect. And we need to unpack what the Rambam is saying. He'll, he'll try to clarify what he's saying. There are, there's objective terminology and there's subjective terminology. Objective terminology is that which is um, um, ontologically real, okay? When I, what I mean by that is, is that it's not subject to debate. I can't, we can't debate what color the sky is. The sky is objectively blue, okay? Can we debate whether Trump is a good president or not? Yes, that's subjective, right? We can debate that all day. People, that's what people spend their lives debating, politics. We can debate virtue. We can debate morality. Those are things which are open to debate. There are certain social conventions based on the civilization in which we live, based on the societies in which, and the cultures in which we live. Those are all subjective truths. But there are objective truths. Before Adam sinned, he saw the world completely objectively, that there is truth and there is falsehood. But after he sinned, he saw the world as good and evil. Good and evil are objective terms, not are subjective terms, not objective terms. Now we're going to explain this more carefully as we go along, but that's the basic thesis of the Rambam in this essay. Okay, for one does not say it is fine that heaven is spherical, and it is bad that the earth is flat. You don't say that heaven is is round because that was the Aristotelian scientific fact that we are surrounded by a sphere. You don't say that that's a scientific goodness. You say it's a scientific truth. Furthermore, do we say that it is the, that the Earth's flatness is a bad thing? Or do we say that the Earth's flatness is a falsehood? The Earth's flatness is a falsehood. It's not a bad thing. Okay. Rather, one says true and false with regard to these assertions. Similarly, one expresses in our language the notions of truth and falsehood by means of the terms emes and sheker, and those of fine and bad by the means of the terms tov and ra, good and bad. Now man, in virtue of his intellect, knows truth from falsehood, and this holds good for all intelligible things, perfect and excellent state, in accordance with his inborn disposition and possessed of his intellectual cognitions, because of which it is said of him, um, thou hast made him but little lower than Elohim. Here Elohim is in the uppercase Aleph, meaning that this is this Pasuk in, uh, in Tehillim means, uh, is describing man as being just a little bit lower than God in his ability to cognize and his ability to have intellect. And what that means is, is that man, when he was first created, was of such a high level of cognition that there was no subjective reality truth and falsehood. He had no faculty that was engaged in any way in the consideration of generally accepted things, cultural conventions. Those are all, 
those don't even exist in man's observation of the world. So among these general accepted things, even that which is most manifestly bad, namely uncovering the genitals, was not bad according to him, and he did not apprehend that it was bad. We have a social attitude towards clothing, and our social attitude towards clothing is that one should cover the private parts okay, of a person's body. There's no obje objective truth to the virtue of covering one's private parts. And so that's something that Adam did not recognize as something that he should or should not be doing. There was no objective truth in that, and therefore he saw nothing wrong with walking around unclothed. Okay. However, when he disobeyed and inclined towards his desires of the imagination and the pleasures of his corporeal senses, and here's where man went down the wrong path. He basically, as the Torah says, he saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight for the eyes. This was really referring to the women. Vatere ha'isha kitov ha'etz l'machol b'chi ta'avahu la'inayim v'nechmad ha'etz l'haskil v'tikach mipiryo v'tochal. Right, you can take a look in the Pasuk. It's in, uh, it's in Pasuk Vav of Perik Gimel, okay? And basically there the Torah states that because she chose to follow down a, down a path of, look, of utilizing her physical senses to perceive the world, that was the sin itself. The sin itself was to, instead of seeing the world for objective truth, Chava chose to try and find subjective aesthetics in the world. And that's what she saw when she saw the fruit of the tree. He was punished by being deprived of that intellectual apprehension. In other words, it's mida keneged mida. You chose, you man, woman, collectively chose to see the world through a subjective lens. I will therefore take away the ability for you to even cognize objectively. And instead of now seeing the world as it really is, as truth and falsehood, from now on you will only be able to see the world as good and bad. So. What the Rambam is essentially telling us is that the eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil is not a raising of man's intellect, but rather it is what? It is a reduction of man's intellect. Because we cognize the world completely objectively as seeing it in terms of truth and falsehood. He was deprived of that ability to see things as they truly are and rather now saw the world through a lens of subjectivity instead of objectivity. Okay? He therefore disobeyed the commandment that was imposed upon him on account of his intellect and, becoming endowed with the faculty of apprehending generally accepted things, he became absorbed in judging things to be tov vara instead of ms and sheker. Then he knew how great his loss was, what he had been deprived of, and upon what estate he had entered. Elohim, knowing good and evil, and not knowing the false and the true, or apprehending the false and the true. So what the Nachash was essentially telling Chava is that you will be like Elohim. Here Elohim means you will be like judges who will be able to discern the world differently from the way that Hashem discerns the world. Here Elohim means not like God, but rather like mortals. And apparently, and this is what we're going to have to unpack the next time we get together, because there's so much density here of information. But essentially what the Nachash is trying to tell Chava is that you're better off not being like Hashem. You're better off not seeing the world in its objective terms of truth and falsehood, but you're better off seeing the world in terms of subjective good and evil. And this argument somehow resonated with Adam and Chava. And we have to figure out why. We have to figure out why Chava succumbed to this argument, because at face value it makes no sense. Why would I want to see the world in a lesser way than the way Hashem sees the world? Why wouldn't I want to see the world in terms of truth and falsehood? Why would I want to see it only like mortal judges who are able to discern between good and evil and not between truth and falsehood? Doesn't seem to make any sense. Can, can people live together in a society unless they can see good and evil? 
Well, it depends how you define society. In other words, what was society? If man had not sinned, clearly our social structures would be completely different, right? Maybe there would be no economy because there would be no need for money because without a Yetzirah, we would just grow our stuff and share it. In other words, our whole social structure is based upon an after-the-sin reality. So who knows what it would have been like? But perhaps that might have been part of the argument of the Nachash, is that mankind is better off in some way having their intellect subdued in some way. That's what ultimately what we're going to have to conclude. Yes, Howard? I'm just wondering, who were these Elohim then? No, you know, I mean, how did the snake even know that they exist if... Per, right, so you have, to su you have to submit that in some way he was projecting a future existence that did not yet exist. Anybody? What essentially his argument was, you'd be better off being like these Elohim that don't yet exist instead of being like Hashem. How we even knew that yeah. concept. Well, yeah, so I mean, who is this Nachash, right? Yeah. I mean, some, some kind of uh, character who is plant, who's a plant put in the garden to be able to make this argument, right? Okay. And of course, we have to remember that according to Chazal, this was all a setup, right? In other words, man is being set up to reach that point of where he becomes like Elohim Yodei Tovara. And why that is, okay? That's all going to be part of our explanation. Well, almost like it has to be, because if it didn't do that, then you wouldn't have got the Torah. And if the Torah is the yep. basis of the world, then that, that's right. the... Right, yes, yes. Clearly, 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 down the road, man had to... Man was sort of boxed into... Adam and Chava were boxed into doing this, yeah. which, of course, and the Medrash describes it as an alila, as a setup. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, we'll get to that. Uh, okay, part of the complexity of this story. With regard to what is of necessity, there is no good and evil at all, but only the false and the true. Reflect on the dictum. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked. It does not say, and the eyes of them both were opened, and they saw. Now when, so when it says, Vatipakachna eneishenehem, this is in Vatipakachna uh, eneishenehem, their eyes were opened. Vayeiduuki erumimhem, and they knew that they were naked. It doesn't mean that they saw their nakedness because they had seen their nakedness all along. For what was seen previously was exactly that which was seen afterwards. It's not like they became aware all of a sudden that, oh, before I was like an animal and now I have awareness. That's exactly the opposite of what the Rambam is explaining now. There had been no membrane over the eye that was now removed, but rather man entered upon another state in which he considered as bad things that he had not seen in that light before. No moreover that this expression, I mean to open, which is vati pakachna, refers only to uncovering mental vision and in, in no respect is applied to the circumstance that the sense of sight has been newly acquired. And so he's going to bring us some proofs that the shoresh, pei kuf ches, like lifkoach, right? Pikrim, pikeach, becomes a means to become it becomes aware. Ki hashochad ya'aver pikrim. Bribery will blind the pikeach. It means someone who has awareness, not someone who has been blind. And he brings us various psukim. You can turn the page now. All of these psukim refer both of them to a likeness in respect of a notion and not with respect to a shape and a configuration. In the same way, it is said the likeness of the throne, the likeness of a throne, the likeness referred to being in respect of elevation and sublimity, not in respect of a throne's square shape, its solidity, and the length of it. I'm sorry. I cut the wrong page. Uh, where am I? 26. 26. Sorry. Uh, he changed his face and now sends forth the interpretation explanation of the verse are as follows. When the direction, okay. Now he quotes a Pusik in Eov. And sorry, sorry about that confusion. At the end of the, of the page here, he says, now concerning, now concerning its dictum with regard to Adam, he changes his face and sends him forth. This is a Pusik in Sefer Eov, that God changed his face and sent him forth. It does not, now it's important to know that the Midrashim, when they quote this Pasuk, say that this Pasuk refers to Adam Harisha. That as a result of his sin, 
Adam HaRishon's Panim actually changed. They were transformed. And it means that he was degraded in some way. But the way that the Rambam, the Rambam acknowledges Chazal's tradition, that this Pasuk, that you changed Adam's face and you sent him forth, refers to Adam HaRishon after the sin. But he says the interpretation and explanation of the verse are as follows. When the direction toward which man tended changed, he was driven forth. Meaning that Adam originally was focused purely on intellect and trying to obtain to the best of his ability all of the truth and the falsehood in the world around him. When he changed his panim, which means when he changed direction, volitionally changed direction by looking at the tree, not as objective truth and falsehood, but rather chose it from an aesthetic point of view, a subjective point of view, that is when he began down the path of sin. And that, says the Rambam, is what the word panim means in that Pasuk in Eov. For panim is a term from the word, verb pano, which means to turn towards a certain direction, lifnot, to turn towards a certain direction, since man turns his face towards the thing he wishes to take as his objective. The verse states accordingly that when man changed the direction toward which he tended and took as his objective the very thing a previous commandment had bidden him not to aim at, he was driven out of the Garden of Eden. This was the punishment corresponding to his disobedience. It was midah keneged midah, measure for measure punishment. He had been given license to eat good things and to enjoy ease and tranquility. When, however, as we have said, he became greedy, followed his pleasures and his imaginings, and ate what he had been forbidden to eat, again, indulging in the aesthetics and in the subjective reality of the world, he was deprived of everything and had to eat the meanest kinds of food, which he had not used as aliment before, and this only after toil and labor. So because you chose to eat of the forbidden fruit, your punishment will be you'll, you will be deprived of the goodness of the garden, and it'll be now more difficult to find your proper food. As it says, thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and so on, in the sweat of thy brow, and so on. And it explains and says, and the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the soil. And God reduced him with respect to his food in most of his circumstances to the level of the beast, which means this only reinforces the Rambam's argument that as a result of the sin, it was not that man was elevated, but that man was reduced, and that he became now forced to find food just like animals have to forage for food. Up until then, when he was in the garden, he was allowed to have food as a god, as an angel, right? Just had to pluck the fruit off the tree, the, the loaves of bread, according to Chazal, off the tree, and it was there. From this point forward, you will have to forage just like the animals of the field. It says accordingly, and thou shalt eat the grass of the field. And it also says in explanation of the story, Adam, unable to dwell in dignity, is like the beasts that speak not. This is a Pusik from Tehillim. Praise be to the master of the will, whose aims and wisdoms cannot be apprehended. Now, this last sentence that the Rambam finishes this chapter with is somewhat indicative of the fact that the Rambam is acknowledging that this is very cryptic stuff. This is mysterious stuff. And there's so much that we have not yet explained in this story. But the Rambam basically says we won't be able to fully understand it, we, that we can't even fathom some of his wisdom. So much more for us to discuss. Some of the things that we have to think about is, um, for example, if Adam was created with the ability to see the world objectively as truth and falsehood, how did, did he have bichira chofshit? Did he have free will at this point? And if he didn't have free will, how could he choose to sin? So he must have had free will, even though he could see the world as truth and, as truth and falsehood, not as good and evil. Because we normally associate free will with the ability to, dis, to see good and evil and then to make an, a volitional choice. But if you see the world completely as good and falsehood, why would you choose falsehood? And how could Adam um, volitionally decide to move towards aesthetics and subjectivity when he was created. I mean, how does a computer which sees truth and falsehood, sees the world as zeros and ones, how does it transform itself to see things as an emotional or subjective being? How does, how does that happen? Um, so these are all questions that I'm going to leave for next time. 
Are there any questions before we uh, before we call it a day? How yeah. Can, how can intellect be uh, DNA's if there's no educational component to it? You're not taught from parents, so other than that, no, didn't go to school. So how, how does how does the Romney see into it? Just, well, well, you it, have the ability, the yeah. potential, but how does that potential become realized? So there is such a concept in in Aristotelian philosophy of endowed intellect, that you can reach a certain level of your own cognition, and then once you reach a certain threshold, you are gifted with additional cognition or intellect from being connected to God. And so the idea that the Rambam would suggest is, is that Adam was such a superior being, he was so connected to Hashem that he shared in God's intellect upon, just immediately upon his creation. Not like us who come into the world as babies and we have to learn everything. Adam was created as a complete human being and therefore was already plugged into that divine intellect. Mm -hmm. And so therefore he didn't, uh, he didn't need to go through that same process of education that we did. No, per perhaps, perhaps the answer to your question is because nobody is like God. So perhaps Adam's sense of truth and falsehood was not quite as astute as God's sense of truth and falsehood. In other words, God created Adam with a sense of truth and falsehood, which was inferior, which, which was man's sense of truth and falsehood, but not God's sense of truth. Good, good. Okay. Think about it. We'll resume the Mirza Shem next week. Have a good day. Yeah. 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 Yeah.